Maybe start off by just saying who you are and why you're visiting Australia. Uh, I am Atikbir Ahmed Saleh. Uh, I'm from refugee camps. In I am from Western Sahara, but coming from refugee camps in uh, west uh, south of Algeria, Tindouf. I'm here in Australia to do a tour uh, about raising awareness uh, among the Australians and talking about the issue of Western Sahara. Um, well, I guess maybe to start off, I mean, one of the issues is um, countries supporting the occupation because of importing Moroccans, like Moroccan stolen phosphate from Western Sahara. So, like, I didn't realise that Australia hadn't completely stopped it. So, would you like to talk about that? And also, I heard New Zealand is still doing a lot of trade. Okay, uh, one of the the, the belong uh, one of the reasons that kept the 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 conflict going on for, for long is the uh, c um, the use of of Morocco the Morocco using the the natural resource of Western Sahara. Um, there are a lot of countries they don't know about the cause of course and they think that they are not involved directly so they don't care. And one of the issues also that most of the people of this country who actually fight for rights and fight for this uh, for justice they don't know that their country or their companies are uh, using this uh, exploiting this natural resource from conflict area so australia was one of them uh, for example uh, but the companies from australia has stopped two years ago maybe three years uh, one of the companies is still haven't been expo uh, explo uh, exploiting uh, the phosphate, but um, they haven't made statement, a clear statement that they are doing so in the future. So there is always the the hope, or there is always the knowledge that they might go back and start uh, making a deal with Morocco to to use the phosphate from from Western Sahara. And uh, it's just been an issue that n none of the a lot of people they don't actually know about the cause, and they don't, they're ignoring it because Morocco is pressing the me international media on the on the case of Western Sahara, and uh, we are one of the longest refugees in the world, like more than 40 decades uh, waiting, to, you know, waiting for the right for self determination until now. Yeah. And uh, people, when it comes to uh, our issue, they always hold the back because most of people they're getting involved in the natural resources like phosphate, fish. Uh, the fishery industry and yeah. yeah. Actually on fisheries, would, would you like to say a bit more particularly with, I know France is heavily supporting Morocco. It's, it's, fishery, in the fishery it's mo most of the, uh, it's uh, the uh, European Union, Spain, France and uh, yeah because they use a lot of, uh, Western Sahara coast is one of the richest uh, coasts in, in fish and a lot of companies from the EU use that fishery yeah. agreement between the Morocco and uh, yeah to explore the fish from our coast yes yeah. and so with because I mean I know that you know since 1991 there's been this ceasefire and there was meant to be a referendum on the act of self-determination but since 1991 which was almost 30 years ago there's still no referendum, nothing's changed. So, I mean, can you tell me what's happening on the diplomatic front and also which countries are blocking the referendum? Just a quick background about the history of Western Sahara. It's usually, it used to be a Spanish colony. Yeah. And uh, and when Spain left the, co the region, they didn't give us uh, self-determination, they didn't give us the decolonization uh, agreement. They had agreements with Morocco and Mauritania to split the country in two halves, uh, north to Morocco and south to Mauritania, yeah. and then, uh, and then they will get the the feedback. Uh, I don't know the yeah. resources yeah. back uh, the deal. So m through that, the Polisario Front fought against the two occupations, the double occupations. Ma Mauritania gave uh, gave in like oh, left the country in three years later and Morocco continue the war. Uh, so the war was, what, the war go, went on until, the, and, until 1991 when the UN interfered uh, with a ceasefire uh, plan uh, 
agree uh, so they have the referendum later on it's, it's not supposed to long f la last for long yeah. so basically the referendum to give the Sahrawi right to vote what they want if they want to enjoy Morocco if they want to have their land and you know yeah. so since then the Morocco and Polisario both agree on this and the, the UN mission uh went on to, uh, to establish the referendum, but the referendum, we never have it. Yeah. We never had any referendum. We never gave the chance for self-determination. And the Moroccan, they just uh, been blocking it since, you know, since uh, they agree on it. And that's because, because of the French. Yeah. They are in the UN general uh, General, General ah. Security, Council. Security Council. So they always block any resolution coming to solve the problem yeah. because they support in Morocco 100% behind the occupation. And uh, since then, there are so, so many uh, UN envious to the to solve the uh, the conflict, and they they always resign for some reason. They never. Give it, they just work on the issue for years and then they resign and saying that we can't solve it. So it seems that there is more power, higher power, you know, over the cause. But lately, when you understand more, you always have to think about the natural resources. Yeah. Morocco is uh, have, uh, against international law, against uh, UN resolutions, against everything they are using then they still exploiting the natural resources from Western Sahara. They have no right to do so based on the international law, but they are not listening. Neither the companies that are investing with them, they are not also listening. So, and yeah, and because of this conflict, there are hundreds of people suffering this, both on both sides, in the occupied territory and the refugee camps. And uh, for some reason, the international uh, Community just silence about it. They don't. See, sometimes they don't even know about it. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Um, like with the Sahara is recognised by the African Union. Like, is there any other, you know, place that you're getting support from, or is it silence from most other countries? No, actually, Western Sahara is one of the founders of African Union. And because of it, uh, Morocco left the before the African Union it was uh, African Unity. And because of it, actually Morocco left it because they recognized Western Sahara as a country. But in 2016, I think they came back for some reason. And uh, yeah, and they've been there facing the Morocco king and the Sahrawi Polisario Front president. They have been in the same, under the same roof, yeah. which is mean that they, they're supposed to recognize us as a country because we are African Union member states. And yeah, but uh, African Union support the cause, and I'm sure they are working on something to do with the, with the case. And we ha we've been recognized by most of African countries, South African countries, South American uh, countries, yeah. and yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned the situation in the camps and in the occupied territory. I mean, in the camps, like, I mean, uh, very poor, and are and whether there are issues because, like the way the UN supplies food and stuff, it's sort of on the basis of if people were just staying there temporarily and not taking into account like population increase through people having children and that sort of thing. So, I mean, what's the situation in the camps like now? How, how, how actually, are that? that's actually one of the main important issues in the camps. Uh, the camp, uh, people in the camps are facing right now. Uh, as you have, uh, as you said, the UN and the, all the humanitarian aid was actually in the beginning aimed to short stay for a shorter period, but now the refugee camps has stayed for over decades, four decades, and generation and generation has born in the refugee camps. I, for example, was born and raised there. Uh, in recent three years, there is a lot of cuts in humanitarian aid, and that's, in fact, directly the, the health of the population uh, in terms of malnutrition, anemia. And they, when you talk to them about these kind of issues, they always bring you, oh, the refugee camp is supposed to be for a shorter period. But they forgot also that this case is in the UN hands. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they are the one who actually stopped the ceasefire promise in the referendum for refugee camp, for, for the Sahrawi people. And they and now they haven't done anything. So it's their responsibility. It's not our responsibility as refugees to stay there for a longer time or shorter time. Yeah. It's in, in the hand of the international community and they, they are not doing anything about it. So to, to just answer your question, we are facing uh, a lot of uh, problems, especially on health. Uh, for the younger generation, for elderly people. We always re receive this kind of aid that uh, doesn't have a lot of priorities, for example, yeah. in food. Uh, it has only main, like to just feed your stomach to be full, but not to get you the nutrients and the macronutrients that you need for your health. Yeah. So you can, you can guess how many uh, health issues you can get from that. Also, the water we get uh, the water from the soil, from the desert soil, and it's usually very concentrated in minerals yeah. that need to be filtered and cleaned to to be uh, uh, to be good for consumption. And we don't have that technology, and we also don't have anybody investing in that technology. So imagine also the drinking water with higher iodine can, that can infect the health of yeah. younger children and women, pregnant women and you know the growth of uh, all these generations so n not let alone the education effect a part of it so there are a lot of uh, issues that coming up from this humanitarian setting uh, humanitarian yeah. aid settings yeah. it's also depend on the donors how much money you get how much you don't get yeah. and uh, if there is any cuts always in fact the first people who got uh, infected it's it's the it's the sahrawi refugee camps people um, is Cuba still providing assistance? And is that different from the way other countries do it? Yeah, m m one of the main things that Cuba is helping with is the education. But you can, or in the beginning, it was easier for uh, for education uh, to get people transported there. But you can see also through the years how things start like slowing down because it's so costly to maintain uh, a lot of uh, students yeah. and to transport them and to educate them for many years. But they have, be they have been helping uh, fairly. Yeah, and they still, of course, support. They haven't uh, back up on their support for the cause. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now maybe a bit, if you know any like, developments inside the occupied ter territory, like, I mean, I've, you know, seen Periodically, reports come out of you know sometimes protests, but often fairly brutal response from the occupied. But I mean, recently there was some story I was reading about people have been celebrating an Algerian victory in the football and the police attack. It's true. One of the things that people they don't hear about is how Sahrawi, uh, in this case, indigenous people in the occupied territory are treated by the Moroccan. Morocco, they always claim that they are treating very fairly. They are treating them just like their own. And they even want us to go back to the Western Sahara and under the autonomy. While we see the exact example setting us uh, where to go. So Morocco is a brutally torturing, uh, prisoning, uh, killing people, Sahrawi people, for even for small, small de demonstration. Recently, people, they left celebrating the, the win of Algerian African Cup, and one girl, uh, she was killed by a, a car, uh, car accident, and others were being imprisoned and uh, tortured. But nobody knows about this because Morocco doesn't allow international media in the in the territory. Even if you can't manage to enter the territory and they start like filming, or they discovered uh, discovered you, they will expel you from the region immediately. Yeah, yeah. You are not allowed to enter. So that's one of the reasons that Moroccan always claim that, you know, they are not doing anything, nobody knows, because of oppressing, oppressing the media, oppressing freedom of expression, oppressing every, every uh, way of people can demonstrate what they want or what yeah, they, yeah. they believe in. Uh, for example, the Moroccans, they always say, oh, we are using this. Uh, they argue sometimes with the companies that, you know, when they ask them about the question for San Sahara, why are you using are you using this money to develop the country? And they always claim that they are doing so. Yeah, yeah. While we don't see any development, for example, the basic thing it's education, yeah. and you don't find any school in the building, any universities, yeah. 
yeah. since the 1975, you don't find any university in the Kuwait territory. The people who have to finish their education, they have to travel to, Mar to Morocco to finish their education, where they can actually be under observation for their, you know, for their interests. Uh, they learn the false information about the country and they can't uh, protest yeah. because of the professors will be jailed or expelled from education. So it's the reason for them. So th imagine how torturing is to, s to sit down and you see your own history uh, being taught to you as something. Yeah. And then you can't, you just shut up, you can't say anything. Yeah. And if you do so, you will be expelled from the school or, you know, and also using people to brainwash them. So the system, everything, so we d and then we don't see any hospitals, health, for example. If you uh, you are sick, you have to be uh, going to Morocco to other cities in Morocco to be treated, and you don't treat it fair fairly, yeah. or you might actually g don't get the treatment that you are need. It's basic human rights things, yeah. and you don't have it there, yeah. and nobody can report it because if you if you be found reporting this kind of things, you 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 your family will be jailed. Or you'll be threatened by your family, by rape, by anything, yeah, yeah. to just avoid you from doing this kind of uh, activities. So, so but I mean, protests seem to sporadically continue. I mean, is it easy from the camps to sort of find out what you know people are thinking inside the occupied territory? Now, nowadays it's easy because there is WhatsApp and Facebook. So you, usually, before somebody gets his phone or his camera out, they might shoot like small videos or small protests, and it's peaceful. Yeah. You can see just people holding the, you know, the flags, or, and sometimes actually they, they are not even being nationalists. They're just protesting for better pay or getting paid or getting employment, for yeah. example. And they get being, they beaten up by the police, they get in, uh, you know, uh, you can, I have so many images to show that. So, now, for example, uh, there are some a group of journalists, Sahrawi journalists, who you try to get the news, but they are threatened. They, yeah. they are always ready to get, to get, uh, you know, beaten or or imprisoned or kicked out. So always, like they manage to have this life, so small videos. New Foundation. Hmm? New Foundation. Yeah. yeah. So you always like have these small videos before, and then sometimes they have to. Uh, to deactivate the account so they don't get rich back to them. So there's a lot of risk yeah. for uh, uh, freedom of, uh, you know, of media and uh, of right expression, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So the sentiment, I mean, on both sides of the line, the sentiment of Saharawis would be, I imagine, very strongly in favor of independence. Actually, one thing, when I was visiting the camps in 2011, there was, like some, dis a lot of discussion going on, and seen particularly amongst younger people, because the, you know, overall policy of the leadership was to try and, you know, achieve independence through a diplomatic path and, you know, sticking with the peace agreement. But because, I mean, really, I guess it was 20 years since yeah. it's ceasefire and no referendum, but it was a very, like a lot of younger people in particular, but also some of the older people were very openly saying we'd rather go back to war, which, you know, the peace isn't, ceasefire isn't getting us anywhere. Um, I was just wondering what the, you know, feeling was now. It's the same because it's hard when your, your, your government feels that, you know, um, peaceful, they still believe in peace. Yeah. Actually, most of the people still believe in peace. Oh, Rather, they prefer to solve this issue as they've been promised before, peacefully. Yeah. Since it's not happening, and it seems that it's, in the, it's not going to happen. Lots of people feel like me, right? I don't think it's going to happen because it just it doesn't show any promising results. So a lot of people, especially younger guys, younger people, they always say, oh, uh, we have waited for 20 years, we didn't have anything, Let, uh, let's just try the war. Maybe they will bring attention to us. Yeah. Because you see a lot of media, a lot of people focusing on media, for example in Iraq, in Syria, where there's actually a war going on. Yeah. You see it a lot of in the media, and when there are hundreds of people peacefully waiting for a peaceful resistance, nobody knows. Yeah. So 
and nobody talks about them and nobody putting them up uh, like talking about their case so they say let us just bring some attention to the international community let us start war let us you know do it yes. and uh, but you know I think we are not deciding if we're just going to go to war or wait for peace because uh, both ways are still like, you know, younger generation thinks something, older generation thinks yeah. something, and until they match, uh, you know, have a balance thinking, we don't know. Yeah. But definitely in the street, people are just fed up. Uh, they think that the UN is not doing their job, yeah. uh, the international community not doing their job, uh, you know, focusing on the conflict, and uh, it's, you know, it's an option that's been discussed by now. And we are only part who are holding to peaceful uh, resolution or peaceful, uh, not breaking the ceasefire. But Morocco has broken ceasefire since, you know, and the UN not, uh, haven't done anything. Yeah. So you also see this kind of another party violating the, the agreement and nobody does anything and we are just the one who's hoping for peace. We think that, you know, it's the world is unfair in this sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Would, would you like to talk about your, you know, what place you'd be visiting and what? Yeah, what I can just, I can yeah. just say, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like as for me, it's. Um, I have been one of the, the thing that's bothering me a lot as international traveler. Oh, I always like to travel. Oh, I didn't get the opportunity that people in the camp got. Uh, it's feeling the the responsibility for bringing their voice outside, and but one of the things that's always bothered me, like when I ever go like to international places, I present myself as I am from Western Sahara, believing that you know, uh, that hoping that everybody knows about Western Sahara. But I always got this face as, where is that? Uh, what is its country? Uh, yeah. You know, aren't you part of Morocco? You know, aren't you? So I always end up trying to explain to people, you know, the the situation where I'm coming from. So it's been uh, it's been kind of one of my response to be advocate for the Sahrawi people everywhere I go. So I have the chance to work as uh, as I told you before. I studied in Norway. Uh, that was uh, very opportunity, uh, very fortunate opportunity for me. Uh, and also I, t I studied in U.S. So that's another la th another level of ignorance about the cause of Western Sahara because actually nobody knows exactly where is Western Sahara. Yeah. So, but when I came back from my studies, I worked in the Ministry of Health and I had the chance to work in, with the African Union through my Ministry of Health. So I have been uh, around a lot uh, yeah. in African countries and I have been with meetings uh, with Moroccans uh, when I present Western Sahara and they present Morocco and they always object on my uh, presence in the meetings, saying that uh, I don't exist, uh, I am, uh, uh, why should I be sitting with Morocco in in the same table, that I am not country and you know. Yeah. So I always, even in technical meetings uh, related to health issues in Africa, I always uh, face this kind. I always have to face the Moroccan to just prove my existence in the African Union, S uh, knowing that we are one of the founders of African Union, and they are just enjoying in 2016. So that was ironic uh, yeah. <laughs> experience for me. So, yeah, and then uh, I hope that in Australia I will get more voices and more people knowing about the cause and uh, supporting maybe the the Australian Support Committee for, uh, for Western Sahara, and yeah. Thanks. Thanks.